I can't control God. It's a risk you take, you know? I can't control the wind yeah. or God. So then, if, then I will call out the tour director. But I'm just saying that if the wind blows, there's nothing I can do about that. I can't control God. Talk to him. Hello everybody, welcome back to The Body Serve. I'm Jonathan. And I'm James. This is a very special presentation, our pop culture season finale to season eight. Wow, we made it. Whenever I hear special presentation, I think of like an episode of a 90s sitcom that was about peer pressure or drugs or something. <laughs> a very special episode. And then they would have like a number to call at the end. Well, in this case, us being a, a gay podcast, the gays are all trying to kill you all. Wow, they are wreaking utter havoc today. So there's going to be spoilers about White Lotus. Mm -hmm. Just I'm going to say that off the bat. I'll give you another warning later. It's been a while now. I feel like this is Thursday. It aired Sunday. We issued Jonathan, the spoiler. People are complaining about spoilers about, like, Jane Eyre. <laughs> Books that were written in the 19th oh century, God. okay? So we're going to release a spoiler alert, just in case. Fun fact, once upon a time a few years ago, I tried to convince you to have us do two podcasts. That we would do the regular <laughs> tennis body serve, and then we would also run a concurrent pop culture podcast. Yeah, can you imagine the amount of work that would have had to go into that well you certainly could not imagine because you you vetoed that with the swiftness after eight years of doing a tennis podcast i almost feel like i chose culture instead <laughs> no no i'm kidding tennis has given us so much and it's created this incredible community that would have been so much more difficult to find i think in in the pop culture space much less intimate probably Definitely less intimate, but you never know. We could have been superstars. True. There is more uh, upside. <laughs> <laughs> I even went to the lengths of sounding out podcast names. I yes. went looking to see if certain Twitter handles were available, who had what, what we could do. But I also understood where you were coming from. I, it definitely would have been way too much work. That I've been taking on... A third full-time job, essentially. Or a full-time job and two part-time jobs. Yeah. With not not exactly like doctor or lawyer's pay. <laughs> <laughs> so this show is in honor of that dream. Yep. Essentially. And mm -hmm. the question to you listeners then, given that preamble, as you listen to this show, do we have the range? <laughs> Would we have had the range so to do this kind of this kind of show? So much pressure. The idea behind this episode is that there are a lot of things that happened in popular culture this year. We are elder millennials now. We don't pay attention to everything. So we're, we're gonna, not geriatric. I prefer elder. <laughs> I don't want to offend the actual geriatric community. Oh my God. Um, and let's be clear. Like there's so many podcasts out there who do this type of thing well. Whenever we're on a road trip, we listen to the read. Always. Yes. Or the various NPR podcasts, Sam Sanders, whatever he's up to. I'll, I'll follow Sam to the moon and back. You are a big fan. I am. The structure of this episode is that we're going to hit on a few different segments of pop culture, be it TV, music, gay shit, <laughs> which I think mm -hmm. is one of the, the categories that we have on this agenda. And in there, I just sprung this on you, we're each going to ask the other a question. Unforeseen. I know what mine is. You don't know what yours is. So you have to like figure this out as we go. But we're going to talk about stuff and I have a question ready for you and you're not going to know what it is. Mm -hmm. And you, you have to come up with something interesting on the spot. Okay, I have something marinating. Okay. We'll get there. Don't worry. All right. Watch me be the one to fail spectacularly. <laughs> the question is like, uh, what's your favorite type of pork? Well, none, if it's you answering the question. <laughs> I do like bacon. Also, you, you you like bacon, but your favorite type of pork is in Vietnamese cuisine. 
Yeah. That's like the only time I mean, you absolutely, eat pork. Oh my god, like grilled pork, the little pork meatballs. But I will say, pork is kind of a gross meat. I wholeheartedly... Even, even at the best of times. Wholeheartedly disagree. <laughs> I have my pulled pork waiting to eat after this recording. Let's start with the media we consume the most of, by, by far, is television. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be a best of list of 2022... It's not going to be, these These are the shows that you must watch. We're going to center it around White Lotus because it has been a cultural moment. One of the few cultural moments in TV on a week-to-week basis that we get to experience anymore. And then we'll just talk about some of the shows that we enjoyed in 2022. I actually did have a top 10 list and it got vetoed, literally deleted from the <laughs> Google Doc. So I had to, you know, scrap it back together from memory Anyway, White Lotus, as you said, it's one of the only watercolor, water cooler, water cooler experiences on TV that we have anymore. You don't paint with oils or pastels? <laughs> right. There's, of course, Abbott Elementary, White Lotus, The Dragon Show, House of the Dragons, and probably a few others. But there are so few shows that bring people together in such a way. And I honestly don't know how big the reach of White Lotus is because my social media feeds are probably so tailored to it, right? My TikTok Mm. is all White Lotus. And I know that's probably mostly because of what I'm interested in, but it just seemed to dominate for, for days after the finale. I remember thinking the season started very slowly. Mm -hmm. I didn't hate it, but I wasn't riveted by it. And then somewhere around episode four and five, Monday would come around and I'd be like, is it Sunday yet? When can okay. I get my fix? And the the discourse around it really started to heat up kind of at the midway point. And Mike White, the creator and writer, he wrote all the episodes by himself. He is, you know, he's showing you a vacation that's roughly a week long. All new people, except for a few characters. And he's actually building characters. We're learning about these people in a very short vacation, sort of day to day. If you think of every episode as one day, it's kind of amazing. And so this slow burn was more than worth the payoff. The slow burn hits differently in this kind of show because he has the added built-in assistance of the Sicilian backdrop. If something's slow burning, if it's taking a while to develop with the characters on screen, you can just sit there, eat your food, and watch the beautiful, beautiful scenery. The, I mean, the stunning backgrounds, the very hit you over the head metaphor of Mount Etna literally erupting and reaching its peak in the final episode, episode seven, where there was magma, lava, magma. I don't know which is which, spewing out of Mount Etna in the background, mm-hmm. and. He's cast incredibly pretty, beautiful men. Yes. You know, this is the male gaze trained upon men. So, Is it the female gaze? I'm not sure. It's, the, it's Mike White, a homosexual. He's bisexual. So that, that checks out. Right. So, the I mean, these are absolutely gorgeous actors who are cast, in a way, to be objectified. The right? four main ones are just stunning to look at. Theo James... Ethan Sharp? Will Sharp. Will Sharp. Ethan's his character. <laughs> Albie. And then... Adam DeMarco. And then the the British con artist. I can't remember his name. And he was given a very uh, Love Island aesthetic on yes. purpose. So mm-hmm. I always assume his name is Connell or like Clive or what are some other very English names that you hear on Adam? <laughs> point is the cast was incredible if that was what you were looking for will sharp in episode seven with his wet t-shirt contest rippling ab thing situation that was going on unreal ridiculous and the season was very much about sex and jealousy and fidelity and what it means and how important it is and overall we know this series is a a semi-satire about the ultra-wealthy, about people who can afford to go on these vacations. And it doesn't actually 
love most of its characters. And these are people who have everything and still find ways to covet. You know, like, I think there's a lot of wanting things that you don't have, even though you have almost anything you could ever want. You have the means to go on a family as a multi-generational boys trip Mm -hmm. and each have your own room at this hotel. But that was was something that struck me. Like, how much do those rooms cost? In real life, uh, it's a small fortune just for one night. Jennifer Coolidge's character is kind of the ideal of that. You have everything, but it's never going to be enough. She was always striving. She was always looking in the first season, finding looking for transcendence and happiness, right? But and blinded an, by her delusion at every step. And total self-involvement. But she was not necessarily a, a bad person, just kind of an, an oblivious person, a thoughtless person. A terminal narcissist. Right. But not, not necessarily unkind or nasty, just somebody who was kind of lost despite inheriting this incredible fortune. I think that's a generous take. When you have your assistant show up and then Greg tells you she needs to be 86th, and you're like, well, just stay in your room for the entire week. That's not kind. But clueless. Mm, And also... No, but at the end of the day, at every turn, she chose her. Like, there was a a limit where she she climbed that Mount Etna, and right before the (laughs) volcano erupted, she would come back down. Yes, yes. In season one... When she was thinking of investing in this wellness business, and she gave every indication that she was, she chose herself. Oh, absolutely. And she was afraid that Belinda put some kind of curse on her, which she earned. If there had been a curse, she would have deserved it. (laughs) But she was blinded by Greg. He said he worked for BLM, which was the Bureau <laughs> of Land Management. She thought it was Black Lives Matter. It was. It could have been this meat cute in mm-hmm. another type of show. But she was. There were clearly things about Greg that were mysterious or outright lies. And now we've understood that there was an entire conspiracy dedicated to killing her yeah. and taking her fortune. You clocked that very early on. We did a, a pretty yes. good. I feel like. Tandem unraveling and decoding this whole mess. Because <laughs> you just you learned very early on that Greg was behind this. And then I picked up the clues. Right, right. I Obviously, was like, she's definitely being recorded. Oh, yes. In this sex scene. Obviously, the gays were up to no good. That was clear. To me, you don't hire an actor like Tom Hollander to play somebody nice. He's the, the British actor who played Quentin. I first saw him in Pride and Prejudice, the Kira Knightley version, and he played the idiotic, um, I forgot what his name was, but the pastor who was arranged to marry Elizabeth Bennet, and they made fun of him. But, but, you know, he plays a loser. Sometimes he plays someone really nasty, but he's a great actor. There was something weird going on. They even explained how the mob had basically murdered this widow on Isola Bella to steal all her money. Mm-hmm. We knew it was coming. They gave you many clues. Yeah. When Theo James said very early on that all these aristocrats in Italy have these big palazzos, but they don't have any cash. Right. They don't right. have any money. I like that the the point of the show is not that it's a murder mystery. I'm not even really all that concerned with who gets shows up dead at the end. You know somebody's going to die. It can be fun to try to figure it out, but it's not like... Mike White is, it's not an Agatha Christie novel, right? That doesn't really seem to be the point of the series. And I appreciated that because you know I don't like the suspense. Right. I like that they gave us clues, that if you were paying attention, you could figure things out ahead of time. What I didn't love so much, it's a two-edged sword, because I loved the absurdity of Jennifer Coolidge's performance in episode seven. Yes. But I did not love the farcical nature of the finale. That was the one thing that I didn't love, which I know I'm in the minority about. Right. Uh, Was it a little realistic that she would start shooting and connect and kill everybody? With her eyes closed. Except for one person? Yeah, it was was probably a little bit of a stretch. There is a bit of the fantastical in this series, the absurd. I mean, in the last uh, season, Murray, is that her name? No. 
Oh, that's his real name. Yes. And Murray Bartlett played someone named Murray in Looking. Mm-hmm. Forgot his name. But, I mean, he shit in a suitcase. Right there. <laughs> and did and, we need to see it? And then we got, definitely did not. And we surely did see it. And it looked very realistic. And then he got stabbed. So it's not exactly a series that's maybe grounded in reality. And that's okay. That's part of the deal. It's part of the deal, but it's also juxtaposed against us, the audience, going along for this ride of making fun of the very real fuckery of rich people. Yes, yes. So does that farcical outcome undercut all of that? That fantasy undercut that ride that we're expected to take? That core tenet of the show? Yeah, I don't think so, because it wasn't so over the top that it was, you know, stupid. Let's talk about Aubrey Plaza giving one of the performances of the year. I mean, as as Harper, her face just takes you through everything. Her scene in the finale with Ethan where he was screaming at her and demanding to know what happened in the room with his frenemy, and the way that the emotions played on her face and you actually couldn't tell as the audience if she was lying. We never found out the full truth. I like that a lot of the stuff was left mysterious because ultimately it doesn't really matter that much. But the way that she sort of shoveled between amusement, she stifled laughter a few times, she was trying to convince her husband that she was telling the truth. I mean, it was just an incredible face performance. I absolutely loved it. As you know, I have never enjoyed anything she's done. Or anything that I've seen her do. Well, you haven't. You've seen Parks and Rec, which you don't really love that much. No, no, I did despise that show. Oh, okay. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) And I know that that's a judgment on me. You're sitting there listening and you're like, wow, that, that checks out. I mean, you don't, <laughs> you don't have to like anything. But I thoroughly enjoyed her in the show. Mm. Like, the woman is super talented. The, the true breakout of the season was... Daphne. Exactly. Megan Fahey. Like... Again, a, a, an actor who can use her face in such a masterly way. When Ethan comes and sits with her on the beach after getting into that big old rumble-tumble-tussle in the water with Cameron. And he's, she's like, is something bothering you, sweetie? Because he came in, barged in her room screaming, and she was totally unfazed. So disrespectful. <laughs> like, how dare you? <laughs> and she was like, whatever. And she processed yet another betrayal from her husband in real time, in such an expertly acted way. Like, this woman is a star. It's almost like the director said, you have five seconds to process the news you just heard. Take me through every single emotion. And and do it flawlessly. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and again, another mystery. Like, she takes Ethan onto Isola Bella. Did anything happen? Um, we're not meant to know. I think we know. I, well, I think something happened. But what did happen? Because right Ethan is convinced that Harper and Cameron did something. Mm-hmm. But for for Daphne, the real betrayal was Harper's, I think. I think what, what we saw on her face was, wow, I actually, like, I thought I made a real friend with this woman. And, okay, well, that happened. And now I'm going to do what I always do. And I'm just going to convince myself that I am not a victim. I don't think it was a real betrayal, because at the end of it, she just met this woman. She doesn't know her very long. But I think they forged an actual friendship through the week. Through captivity. Yeah. Mostly. (laughs) When she abducted her. I think it was more, this was yet another, another betrayal that she's had to Mm -hmm. deal with. But this one is so intimate. This isn't a sex worker. This is a woman that they have a friendship relationship with. Right, but what's more intimate than your partner, your actual partner, betraying you? Right. No, that's what I'm saying. I mean, on both counts. I think more telling there is that she has to balance her own feelings of betrayal with talking Ethan down from the ledge. (laughs) And also not making this situation combust in a way that will, A, ruin the vacation, and also ruin the potential for this to be a more lasting friendship. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about that. Let's talk about violence and the specter 
of male violence that is kind of like hovering around the edges. We never actually saw in an exploitative way male violence against women, but it was always there, right? So Mm -hmm. when Ethan is screaming at his wife, you're thinking, what happens if this escalates? And we're meant to believe that he's the most even keeled of the males, of the men on the show. Exactly. That he's the most evolved. But when it comes down to it, we (laughs) see this. Yeah. And when Jack basically abducts Portia, the the specter of violence is obviously very immediate. You're wondering, is he going to kill her? Is he going to hit her after she said that thing about fucking your uncle? She's extremely vulnerable. And I thought it was interesting that this possibility was always there, but it was never really acted on. And I actually, for once, enjoyed that kind of restraint because when it boiled down to it, the people who were actually intending to do violence were the gays who abducted... Um, what's her face? <laughs> These gays. Jennifer Coolidge. Tanya. They're all trying to kill... They're all trying to murder me. And the only one who does killing is Tanya. Mm-hmm. Well, what? that's only because she's sure. protecting herself. It was... She was definitely going to be murdered. I mean, the rope and the gu- Somebody, the vulture of yours, said she had an entire clue board in that bag. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, the rope. Well, maybe not. Maybe... Maybe it's a sex thing. Right. And then the oh, gun. A gun. A gun. Mm. Well, he's probably in the mob, so yeah. It took the gun. And Right. To really clue her in. And then she pulled out a candelabra. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but really. Delusion is a huge theme in this series, I feel, as well. Not just with Jennifer Coolidge. And we see the apex of that with the post-mass murder scene, where she goes to Tom mm. Hollander and asks him... Just level with me. Is Greg cheating on me? It was... It was so perfect. What an amazing character beat that was. She's in shock. She's just murdered people. And saved her own life. And she's still worried about whether her husband is cheating. Mm -hmm. Her physical acting is... (laughs) It's laughable how funny it is. When she decides that she has to leave... The bridge deck aft, where everybody (laughs) is congregating, where the countdown is happening to her impending death. And she's like, well, I'm going to check for the captain. I'm going to go to the other side of this sail, this yacht. And I'm going to, you know, you know, walk normally for a few, few steps (laughs) for a spell. And then I'm going to when everybody can see her. (laughs) That was so, oh my God. Like, that was so menacing. Them watching her do mm-hmm. that in almost amusement, knowing, well, she's not going to be alive for very much longer. Well, they they don't take her as a formidable foe. Oh, right. No, they think she's a fool. She's spiraling, and we'll just let her continue to spiral. Maybe that'll make this easier in the end. Mm-hmm. And you noticed the Italian guy with the mustache when he was saying goodbye to her at the palazzo was weeping mm-hmm. because he knew what was coming. Yeah. That see that sealed it for me. It's like oh oh no girl, you need to get away now. This man is crying because he knows they're gonna kill you. That's the guy from Emily in Paris. No, that guy was one of the dead ones. Oh, <laughs> the gray-haired guy. The sheer stupidity on display between Jennifer Coolidge and Portia. 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 Portia, Portia got away really by accident. Portia waits. Till she gets in the car with Mr. Love Island to confront him about possibly maybe trying to murder her and her boss. <laughs> like, why not have that conversation in open air? Right. You're in a populated area in a town. You could have spoken about this outside. But now you're in a locked car with the child security locks on. You're not getting out. This is not a victim blame. But. But. Mike was like, I'm going to create a character. So stupid. So clueless. So oblivious to red flags. It will blow your mind. And he did. Well done. The highlight of the episode, though, the finale, for me... Was the captain? No. Anch'io sono gay. Well, you got that more in real time because you speak Italian, right? I assumed context clues. I assumed that's what he was saying. He was so excited. He said, siamo tutti gay. But... (laughs) The highlight for me was when Portia was speaking to Jennifer Coolidge and trying to clue her in as to her her doubts, her grave 
doubts. <laughs> and then Jennifer Coolidge is like, well, you know, I did stumble upon something the other night with your little paramour. And Portia's like, well, just spit it out. Just spit it out. You, well, they were, they were doing stuff. What do you mean by stuff? Well, he was kind of fucking his uncle. <laughs> I'm excited for season three. I hope that the two couples come back. I want to see them explore this further. I think the power dynamic has shifted. <laughs> They're yes. not just between the two men and the two women, but, but between the men and the women as well. I think there's more to explore there. And I would like to continue to see Will Sharp and Theo James. Yes. Let's just take a moment to recognize that My Girls won. Yes. Mm-hmm. Lucia and Mia... They did the work, they scammed, they fought, they did what needed to be done, and thank you, Lord, we did not have another show or movie where a sex worker gets killed, because Mm -hmm. that's not acceptable in 2022. Not only did they look out for themselves and secure the bag, but they helped people along the way. Yeah, I think maybe Alessio was like one of the only good men on the season. Because he just pretended to be an evil pimp where he was really just Lucia's <laughs> friend. I wonder what kind of cut he got. Right. But Mia helped out Valentina. It was self-serving because mm-hmm. she got to do, you know, the piano bar gig. But Valentina got, like, she got a lot of self-discovery out of that. No, it's like scammer with a heart of gold. Definitely. Exactly. And also Lucia and Albi, like she did a world of good for him. When 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 did she did she because now he knows that he had been had when he meets up with Portia and those two dunces are in the airport and they can reflect on their cumulative stupidity and maybe right, grow but, from that. But will he learn? I will say I was surprised. You've got Michael Imperioli, Christopher Moltisanti. I thought they would use him a little more. Like, I thought he would have more of an arc. I'm glad they did. He's... Jonathan, please. He is <laughs> such an incredible actor. Christopher. Okay. Okay. This is not an entirely White Lotus podcast. Let's talk about TV in general. I wanted to say a little... I was bringing this up with people at work and nobody bites. To me, the golden age of TV, peak TV, is is over. I think we can accept that. What was the, it? The golden age is not going to last forever. It was probably like the mid 2010s. You just had an incre- like a litany of high quality shows that really played with the form. Some were quote unquote prestige, such as such as uh, I mean, Better Call Saul when it first came out, the ending seasons of Mad Men, Breaking Bad. But of course, then there were all these women led shows, Better Things, LGBTQ representation. It was just such a diverse era, and it still is, but I think... It's more diverse than ever now. It is, but there's such a preponderance of IP series, and I want to acknowledge, like I'm not on a high horse here, the apps, Netflix, and all of that, it's always been algorithm-driven, of course, but it's very obvious now. I I feel like so many of these shows are actually just garbage, producing absolute trash, because it hits their key demographics and their key kind of customer personas. IP can be great right, when it's used well. Like we've got Wednesday, which was pretty good. I wouldn't say it was amazing, but it was pretty good. Never watched it. But even the, the Adams Family movies in the 90s were trading on this 60s sitcom. That was IP technically. And those kind of reinvented what the Adams Family was. It was clever. It was hilarious. So Wednesday did a good job with it. But there's like a lot of IP that's just boring, repetitive, annoying, re- endless I reboots. I think maybe you need to explain better what IP right. TV is. So it's intellectual property. So Disney bought the Marvel Universe, for example. So Disney owns every iteration of Marvel. The Avengers, Black Panther. Star Wars. Iron Man. Yes, they also have Star Wars. And so Star Wars has a million offshoot series. I don't really know anything about Star Wars, so I assume some of them... I've heard some of them are excellent. I'm sure some of them are like, bleh. And so this concept isn't necessarily bad, but you do get a bunch of just 
annoying derivative shows. Mm -hmm. It's a consequence of it. So you're wistful for the pretension of the golden age of TV? <laughs> I don't see it necessarily as a bad thing or as bad as you make it out to okay. be. I, well, because unlike film, there's still room for diversity in television. Yes. No, okay. So think about when the when streaming was brand new. That That's what I'm... It's sort of nostalgia, sort of not. When streaming was new, it felt like this brave new world. Now everybody has a streaming service. They're trying to make money. They need... You know, Netflix is canceling truly excellent... TV. HBO because, Max is doing it too. Right. Because as much as we laud HBO Max for mm. creating this water cooler week to week moment, and they're mostly the only streamer that's still able to do that, they're canceling shit left, right, and center. They just canceled Minx this week, mm -hmm. which was a couple weeks away from finishing filming its what second is, season. What is that? And so they're now <laughs> resolute. Mm hmm. To shop oh. that show somewhere else because they are convinced they can still get three seasons out but of it. But why would these companies pay the money for production? Because they own the verticals too, right? Like they they pay for the production and the distribution. Like why would they do that? There's so much waste, so much money <laughs> wasted. It's yeah. crazy to me. So I don't know. I there are still tons of amazing TV series, but I will say it's getting harder to make my top ten. Or, or no, it's getting easier. Like, it's not it's not hard to leave things off anymore. Whereas, probably four years ago, I had, like, a top 30. I mean, I think that's just more a function of your pretension than anything else. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, some of the shows that we enjoyed a lot in 2022. Mo? Yeah. Loved Mo, but I left it out my top 10 because of the finale. Well, I didn't make a top 10. Oh, okay. It just shows that... We enjoyed. Did we not enjoy it? Definitely did. Is it worth watching? Definitely. Would you re recommend it to the listeners? Without a doubt. <laughs> Sin duda. We may differ on this, but I really enjoyed season two of Industry. Mm -hmm. I yeah. feel like Industry tried to be something it wasn't in season one and then found the formula in season two. They, they really understood just how awful these people were. <laughs> <laughs> and found a way to corral that in a way to make it interesting. And not just a hodgepodge, splash, Jackson Pollock of awfulness on the TV screen. Mm. I would... Industry is a very, very good show. But I wouldn't say it was a show that I enjoy watching. You definitely didn't. So, I mean, I give it props because I really think it's you definitely quality, doesn't because but... You definitely didn't because we have a... A running list of shows written on a piece of paper so that we can remember to watch things, right? Mm -hmm. There's always a list of like 10 to 20 shows. And say it's a Thursday night and I'm home from work, ate dinner, and we're like, well, what are we going to watch? There are no below decks that night. Oh my God, what do we do? We're spiraling. <laughs> and then you're like, well, there's this, there's that, and then there's your and show. There's, know, there's your show industry <laughs> i'll list all the ones i really want to watch and then i'll say oh and there's and you keep this from me because yes. you are i make the list this is the this is the gig here the gag i make the list but you keep the list from me I, it's almost yeah. always in your possession and so i will be like what what are we watching what do we have to watch and then you list up and often the shows that you know i want to watch that you don't want to watch you kind of either list it last or leave it out kind of hope that i bite on one before you have to say industry at the end yeah so what or acapulco nobody cares about that everybody does that what are your other shows damn uh, speaking of harper there was a harper in that show it was a big year for harpers in industry oh yes one yes. of the truly wretched people on earth fictionally <laughs> yeah as so is our i'm sure the harpers that you all know in real life are lovely but the fictional ones whew. better things this is this is my jam. Uh, One Pam of your top three favorite shows of all time. Pamela Adlon's, uh, don't even want to call it semi-autobiographical, whatever. It has some vague resemblance to her real life, but it is such, it's just such a lived-in, kind of realist show, and weird, and 
it got increasingly weirder. Weirder. It did, and the form is so odd, and there's not always like a running storyline to keep track of. I just absolutely, I can. It's the kind of show that you feel you can live in. I just adore it. Easily one of my favorites of 2022. Heartstopper. Yeah, definitely. Let's replicate that algorithm and get more of that. Right, but keep, but keep it good. Because you know there's always diminishing returns with these kind of things, right? We'll say more on Heartstopper later because under the gay section, mm-hmm. we'll be talking about Kit Connor a bit. Yes. Somebody Somewhere is an example of a show that never could have been made in the broadcast network era. Correct. Which is an, an argument maybe in your favor that peak TV still exists because it's, you know, it's this sort of small character driven. It's led by a comedic actress. It's more populist. It's literally middle America, right? It's in Mm. the middle of America. I think the benefit of this era of television is that while you don't get those prestige things, which I honestly, they've never really been my bag. Right. Right. Which is where my pushback They're also, come from. Most of them are like very masculine. Very male-driven. I think we're inundated with a lot of trash. No. There's a lot of yeah, bad just, stuff to sift so through. There's so much. Right? But if you're willing to look, you can find some serious gems. Mm-hmm. And this was one of them. And it's a type of show that if you read the description, maybe watch the trailer, you may not think this is for me, but it's one of those really surprising shows that has so much heart and relatable mm. to, to a wide cross-section of people. Unless you're like a hardcore Republican. <laughs> or, I don't know, close-minded. Mm. Abbott Elementary, I don't know what more we can add to the conversation. It just, Quinta just, it hits every week. This woman knows what she's doing. Yes. This may be heresy. Mm. Dare I say this on air? I don't know. What is it? I enjoy her so much more as a writer than an actress. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I think that's the one room. F- There's so wow. little room for improvement on the show, but I don't necessarily enjoy her as an you actress. You know, things are really coming together for me because is this why you don't like Parks and Rec? This nerdy, striving female lead character? Maybe. Wow. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I've not thought about it that deeply, but I... I just find her kind of annoying. I'm hitting the misogyny alarm here. Which I get is the point. <laughs> yes, she's annoying. But you know what? I, I don't need a bait or a worm on the end of a, a line to dislike men. <laughs> I just don't deal with annoyance yes, very well. Yes, But she, uh, she is like people who exist in real life. I don't know people like that. Oh, all right. Girl, I do. <laughs> <laughs> she's incredibly talented the show is a godsend like mm-hmm. and still her performance is objectively very good i just don't i enjoy her the least of everybody okay. on that show is what i'm saying it's a hard it is a hard rule to fill i will say and one of the best decisions they've made is keeping ava mean right keeping, i know keeping you say ava that messy no i know you say that but ava still has moments of serious heart and redemption she does. in this show. But the writers have even said, okay, we we want to do this, but we have to keep it to a minimum mm-hmm. because we don't want the character to change essentially. It's a, it's a necessary balance. Yeah. Because it can't be all uh, comic relief, all kind of nastiness all at the same time because it does get old. Yeah. I mean, we are a season and a half into the show. There's only so much will they, won't they with Gregory and Quinta, that I will <laughs> be able to stomach. It's just, I mean, the oldest sitcom convention in the book, Sam and Diane. Right. I don't enjoy that. That's it's, it's that's fair. If it goes on too long, it's too much for me. And of course, like Jim and Pam, this show is very similar in mm-hmm. form to The Office. One of my favorite shows of right, all time. Right. I think this is the first uh, mockumentary kind of series that you actually like. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> I don't like the form. Right, you know, right. The Bear. We talked about this extensively on a previous episode of our regularly scheduled programming. On our tennis podcast? On one of our Q&A we, episodes, probably. Yeah. Luckily, we put timestamps, so people probably just stopped it at that point. The Bear was easily one of my top five this year. And color me surprised that Mr. Shameless, Mr. Lip, Mr. Lip Gallagher, 
as a lead, was able to instill and distill so much heart in this show. I mean, it was so good. It really was. And I. it makes me upset that Ayo Edebiri, who played Sydney, is not getting the lead actress nominations that she should in comedy series. It is, in my opinion, the most competitive category at any TV award show, the lead comedy actress. Every year I feel like I can name 20 who are deserving. Mm-hmm. But she, it's a two-hander in my, like, there is no show without her. For me, Lip is got, should win oh, for yeah. lead actor. I think he should. The lead actor category is always pretty slight. So It uh, is. Yeah. I mean, is this any surprise? I mean, in, I feel like year after year, the woman outshined the men in, in, in so many, so many fields. Yeah, but in comedy especially. This year at the Emmys, the lead actor in drama was phenomenal with Brian Cox, Saul Goodman, Bob Odenkirk, the gentleman from Squid Game who ended up winning, who I can't remember his name, Jeremy Strong. A very competitive category. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I don't want to be, you know, thoughtless here. Hacks. Hacks, I it, feel like, has gotten forgotten a little bit this year. Gene Smart has won the last two Emmys. Right, but like in the conversation. It was such a good season. I agree. Hacks is such a good show. And the the lead that plays opposite Gene Smart, what's her name? Hannah Einbinder? Annoying. Annoying as all can be. <laughs> I despise, <laughs> cannot stand, but I still enjoy. Yes. See, that's what I'm saying. Like, the annoying, the annoyingness mm. in any character. I can't deal with it. She's annoying because she's us. She's this millennial stereotype. Speak for yourself. She's you not know. me. No, but she's meant to be kind of what Deborah hates most about millennials, oh. which is a stereotype. Yeah. She is the daughter of Lorraine Newman, who is uh, one of the original cast members of SNL. Mm. Deceased. No, still alive. She's still alive? Yeah. Oh. Why am I here trying to kill people off? <laughs> Damn. No, I mean, R.I.P. Gilda Radner, the genius. Maybe that's what I'm yes. thinking of. Gene Smart, what a late career renaissance. Forget it. Mayor of East Town. Mm. I even loved her Frasier guest ap- recurring guest appearances. Did you watch Designing Woman? I did Probably not. No, because I'm a Golden Girls partisan. And there was a small overlap. <laughs> no, there was a small rivalry because they would make Designing Women jokes on Golden Girls. Mm. I don't know why. You forget Fargo as well. That's where it really started, oh, yeah, I feel. Yeah, season three, I think, of Fargo. Yeah. Real World Homecoming. Mm, I forgot this. This would have bumped something off of my top ten list. Do you even have Definitely. this list? Or are you just going to blame me for deleting it? <laughs> no, I do. A lot of these shows are on it, so I won't even bother. But Real World Homecoming actually brought up some fascinating conversations about white tears, about <laughs> anti-racism. No, I'm being dead serious. Like, I know you're being dead serious, about but the, I can't help but laugh. About because... the presumed innocence of white women, uh-huh. about the manipulative behavior that Julie did in 2001 or whenever it was that didn't work this time. That... Because we live in a profoundly different culture. We do. But even after reading stuff like White Fragility, which maybe Julie did, maybe, well, we're told a lot of people on tennis Twitter did, a lot of people in <laughs> in tennis establishment did, we are two years on and seeing a regression or maybe just an exposure of the real self. And I think <laughs> Real World Homecoming dovetailed with that experience for me. Mm-hmm. I just liked that we got this really meta view of one of the original reality shows. We actually got to talk about what what it's like to make a reality show. Well, because one of the conventions of reality is that you never talk about the production, Mm -hmm. right? In Real Housewives, you never acknowledge that you're on a show. And that's, that's just one of the things that they do in reality series. I don't know why. But on this one, we actually got to deconstruct what it was like to be on a show, how it affected their lives, what are the things that didn't appear that made them resentful or look different or hate each other. Specifically and, Melissa. Yeah. Melissa, wow. Well, she, think, she was like, really done dirty by that show because I, as of what, when did this show air originally? 2000? That would have been, what, 15, 16? I bought into that. The vilification of Melissa. Mm, oh, back God. Then. I loved Melissa. I, well, I found her annoying back then. <laughs> but I'm sitting here watching her as this 
full grown woman, a big lamb, by the way, <laughs> who has impeccable taste, just tweeting the other day a video with her musician husband singing along to Fly Like a Bird. Wow. Incre- impeccable taste. Like, Melissa came with receipts, with a foundation to handle these people mm-hmm. on the show. But so intelligent, so adult with the way mm-hmm. that she she broke down what was really going on here. So um, multiple things can be true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she, I mean, she was the anchor of, of the season, definitely. We'll speed through the, the last few. Good mm-hmm. Fight, honestly, Good Fight was not in my top 10. And it, it killed me because I told you a few episodes ago that I would go anywhere the kings lead me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michelle and I don't I don't remember the other. Not one. Darren. No. Anyway, they're a husband and wife creator team. Darren Star. Oh, <laughs> they created Robert. Is it Robert? Yes, yes. Yeah. Robert King created Good Wife, Good Fight, and Evil. Love them all. But I was a bit let down by the final season of Good Fight. The first half was not good. The second half, I think, did a lot to redeem it. Yeah, yeah. But I would watch these actors. To the, to the stars, to the moon and the stars. Audra think, McDonald, Christine Baranski. Yes, I think your biggest issue was the, the tripping that Christine Baranski yeah. was doing this season. You were not into the hallucinations. It was too the... much like her charming laugh. Mm-hmm. It killed me because the charming laugh actually got annoying, mm. which I thought was impossible. I don't like, I don't like drug things on TV. Like uh, Broad City did a whole episode where they were tripping where, Mad like, Men did where it. they were rolling. Mad Men did it too wasn't they that their it, finale did it really well though with Roger and his wife yeah and no but you know these sort of bottle episodes where like the characters go on a trip is super annoying to me uh, I'd rather skip the whole thing it's boring I will say same with dreams I do is, not do not give a fuck about dreams this is a show that has withstood so many big characters leaving Mm -hmm. over the course of its what seven seasons six i think six seven that many times we were wondering well how are they going to continue are we going to even like this show anymore and repeatedly they bring people on and it works Mm -hmm. just like call the midwife (laughs) that show will never die i hope not this season i thoroughly enjoyed andre brower Yes. I mean, there was so much to dislike about his character, but being such a talented actor, he made it work. P-Valley. P-Valley is almost structured like a musical, where they have these incredible set pieces. It is unlike anything on TV. There is not one (laughs) TV show that is like Mm P-Valley. And even if it's jarring, even if it's a bit much for you... Even if you don't understand the world that these characters live in, it is a masterpiece. And I also, I don't think it's a coincidence that several of the black-led shows have handled COVID in the best ways. The Mm. most interesting ways, the most responsible ways. Queen Sugar is the other one I'm referencing. P-Valley, people felt like, oh, this is, they've lost the plot or whatever in the first few episodes. The season was worth it. They knew what they were doing. I will say, a lot of times when I watch shows that I love and P-Valley is right up there, I will go look at the hashtag on Twitter and see what folks are saying. Mm. And because this is such a distinctly black show, there is a lot of black commentary about it. And one of the most disappointing parts for me was how, in season two, it devolved into like, this shit is just way too gay, way too sus, way too this, way too that for me. But like, what... Did you think you were watching in the first season? Where did you think this was going? (laughs) Like, this was just gay in the abstract? Right. This this was a very queer show from the beginning. Like, Uncle Clifford is not to be defined. But they just added some gay sex scenes and it made you uncomfortable. Not even that that explicit. Um, Not even that (laughs) explicit. I mean, we've had way more straight shit. But I, I was surprised where they took it. And it mm. wasn't, like, lurid or anything. It was just what you would show straight people doing. Mm. Watch it. I will recommend that show to the to the mountaintop, to Mount Etna and back. This other show, we just mentioned it, Queen Sugar, uh, also, like Good Fight, I feel, suffered from an uneven final season, which mm. is a shame. I think they could have done it in six episodes. Mm. 
I mean, they could have done it a lot better if Charlie was there. Yes. There was a gaping absence throughout the season. And way too much Nova. Like, bring me back to the terror days of True Blood. No. Like, that's the Nova no. I prefer. No. <laughs> bring me back to when Nova threw out her brutal cop boyfriend. Oh, no. She just brought him back yeah. to to be with him forever. Mar- married him. Mm. They got married, right? Honestly, I don't even remember at this point. And- <clears throat> I was just so shook by how much he was on in the season seven. I was for sure convinced that had been wrapped up in season six. Yeah, with a bow on it. This is going to hurt. This is a show that you made me watch. And you didn't want to watch it. I, I didn't. You heard it was depressing and gross, which it is. Very, it's dark. It's it's a tough watch. But Ben Wisham, that's the name, right? Wishaw. Wishaw. Wait. It's Ben Wishaw. It is? Don't you know your are Oh, yeah. No, you're right. He is an openly gay actor. He's incredible in it. Is there more to say? Uh, I mean, it's basically showing you the decaying, underfunded NHS NHS hospital where he works. It's not glamorous. It's very disturbing and sad. And it also sh- runs concurrently with his decaying gay relationship. Yes. And how his professional life affects that. I was surprised by how much I enjoyed that mm-hmm. show. Finally, I want to say that... This is a new edition. I just finished watching Smiley, which is a Spanish language set in Barcelona, I think. Mm-hmm. Gay show. Like, cute little 30, 35 minute episodes, eight of them. And it features my forever bay, Carlos Cuevas. Adored it. Just loved, loved it. Yeah, I just started it and I'm really enjoying it as well. <laughs> I, I don't usually like, I, I prefer to listen to Latin American Spanish, no shame at all. To the Europeans, but it's just my preferred uh, iteration. Mm. We were watching something the other day, and you're like, "Why is this Mexican Spanish so fast?" Yeah, we're legit shook. I was like, I'm used to watching House of Flowers, mm-hmm. where a lot of the characters talk super slow because they're Ay, on drugs. Papi, <laughs> por qué está como eso? And then I learned it's because they're supposed to be on pharmaceuticals, and it's like an <laughs> in joke. And I'm like, but I can actually understand this. Thank you. <laughs> I've mentioned this on the show before. Maybe that one of my missions for 2022 is to learn Spanish better. Yeah, I did a lot of actual schooling school learning when i was younger Mm -hmm. i did a level spanish did spanish language exams did spanish literature exams did spanish oral exams and then you know you move on with life and if you don't practice this stuff you lose it right i was never fluent but i want to be fluent so this year in january i decided i'm i'm gonna watch as many spanish language shows as possible and eventually i will hopefully my ear will become better i'll hopefully become more fluent it's getting there, I think. It may take a couple mm. more years. It'll definitely help. Uh, watch Spanish shows with the subtitles in Spanish as well. Mm. That's the next level that can really help. So Smiley was along those lines. Es smiley. <laughs> I'm not even going to sit here and try and recommend other Spanish language shows to you because a lot of them are salacious and trash. Which will lead right into, uh, we each get one rant. About TV, Mm -hmm. it's going to be very fast. It's going to be a lightning round read. Mm -hmm. Before we take a break, before we go on intermission. because we've done a lot of TV. I get you guys are probably waiting for the next subject. No, I mean like before we we stop the recording, pause the recording, and go for a break. It's been an hour of TV. Yes, that is true. My rant, that was a setup for me, right? Yeah. My rant, I have sat through so many seasons of Elite, and you mock me. This was the first season I gave up. You No, but you've mocked me from day one because I've always called it Elite, and you're like, it's elite. It's elite, bro. It's I mean, elite. You just sound, you know, just a little, a tinge too much. You it's sat like here... if de- I were to say, oh, I love mozzarella, you know? No, that's not even a possibility because where <laughs> you come from, you say mozzarella. <laughs> <laughs> Prosciutto. Calamar. Yeah, there's some reasons for that you okay. know italian is very regional language okay. a lot of dialects but no i'm saying i learned i also learned like book italian right like florentine italian the traditional so i, I know how to pronounce these things i'm just saying i don't 
always say it the the most in in a, in a flourish. So why did you make me feel like such a loser and an elitist for pronouncing it elite? Because it was fun. <laughs> Anyway, this is not your rant. What is your rant? My rant is this season was one of the worst seasons of TV I've ever seen in my life. It was unbelievably bad. It was unfathomable. Every decision the writers made was atrocious. I sat there in disbelief, often watching this show while you're sleeping because you had decided to give up on it. Mm -hmm. Normally we watch it together. And this is like 12 to 3 a.m. over the course of three days I'm watching this show. And it was just... I, I could not believe it. It could not even be saved by Manu Rios and Andre La Molia giving us something to look at. Right, because that's that was the only reason to watch the previous season. Like, you give us a two-minute sex scene of those two in last season to do this this season. For those of you who, mm. who watched the show and who've watched it, to see how that played out, it's just... I almost stopped watching, honestly. It was, it was so bad. It's never really been the same since the original, some of the original people left. We lost Lou. We lost the Countessa, or the Marque- Marquesa. You're a big fan of Lou. Oh, I loved her. And you know, she's a Mexican pop star. I have mm-hmm. a few of her songs on my Spotify, liked songs. She's good. Jaime Lorento, which was Samu's brother. You are a big fan of him. Oh my God, I love him. And then uh, Aaron Piper. What's, oh, uh, that's my what's favorite. What's name on the show? Yeah. No, what's the name on the show? Ander. Ander, yeah. Who is my, you know, when you're on Netflix and you can pick a, an avatar from like a, a, mm-hmm. a person from I, a TV show? I picked it for you. You, you picked it that? for me because I was a mm-hmm. big fan of Ander. He's kind of a dick though. Like on the show. Yeah. He was a total I mean, nobody's asshole. good on that show. Yeah. Anyway, Elite was getting bad and apparently it jumped several sharks in this season. I didn't watch it. You want to know what my rant is? Yes. We were talking about the end of the golden age of TV. We are also, we're talking about the end of the crown. To me, this is symbolic of the decline of television because the crown was, I mean, the crown is still very well made. The the thing looks Mm -hmm. gorgeous. It looks prestige. It's well acted. This season was horrible. I'm just going to say it. It was not good. The demure, like, chin down, eyes up, Elizabeth Tadicki. What's going on with Diana? Like, and I know, no, I was, I am definitely blinded by just everything that they did with Diana. They made her into a silly, self-centered, ridiculous person. A silly girl is what Diana came off as. I, it was really upsetting, man. Yeah, it, it was, sucked. It was not good. And I, then the, the gall, the audacity, and the nerve. I sent out a tweet with those three words, those three (laughs) sentences, short sentences about Nick Kyrgios the other day, but it applies to the writers and creators, casting directors of The Crown to have the role of Prince Charles played by Dominic West. A very handsome man in his 50s. That was, I mean, you already had Josh O'Connor. Josh O'Connor is cute. But he was at least more of a resemblance. And at that time in Charles's life, like he, you could make the argument that the cute ugly of Charles in his 20s was more akin to the cute ugly of Josh O'Connor <laughs> playing this role. Like that's an argument it's, I'd be more willing to buy. But Charles in his 50s, played by Dominic West, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. The entire season was just like elite, like elite. A dumpster fire. <laughs> as as an American, I don't have a horse in this race. Growing up, nobody I knew cared about the royals. My parents are completely disinterested, which is very different than it is here in Canada, I find, and other Commonwealth countries, like where you grew up. And, of course, people were, like, reading tabloids and stuff about Diana. She was popular, but nobody cared about the rest of them, at least in my in my little world mm-hmm. where I grew up. So I don't I don't really care about these people. I care about Diana. Now that is my girl. Casting (laughs) (laughs) Casting aside, we are entering a phase of this storytelling that is way too close to our recent memory, where we've lived through this stuff. I feel like part of the appeal of this show was you could start in the 50s where Elizabeth is, oh my God, daddy's dying, and I'm going to be the young queen, and then she goes on her little royal trips, 
and you go look them up. You go mm. on Wikipedia. You're like, oh, this happened. That happened there. They didn't talk about the genocide in Kenya, but you know, right. like it is a very royalist series. But you you can still appreciate entertainments that are right wing, like Downton Abbey. Love it. The Marvel Cinematic Universe. Some of y'all love it. Um, <laughs> the the. <laughs> The military complex propaganda of Top Gun. <laughs> yeah, apparently everybody, everybody, the world, except for me, has seen it. And they all love it. Even the, the communists love it. Right. But um, my, my point in saying that is there was a level of detachment from the early seasons where we didn't live it. We didn't, we didn't know too much about it. It wasn't so much a part of the pop culture experience for mm-hmm. us that it was kind of novel that we could maybe ignore things that weren't historically accurate exactly. more easily. We're like, oh, well, this happened. Well, they didn't portray it this way. But, you know, that actress gave so Claire Foy did such a good job. I mean, she was the best queen by far. And she also benefited from distance. Mm. You you could just look at it as history. Yeah, that's my point. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know what they're going to do with the next season, but this was not it. Babe, I am not looking forward to what's coming, which is Diana's death, which is devastating. Even to still think about, Mm. to hear Prince Harry Mm. talk about it in his documentary with Meghan. We're not going to get into that because, you know, we uh, we don't deserve... Somebody said I was Sussex Squad, and I'm like, who even is Sussex? And then, like, it took me a good while to figure out what the titles are. Listen, I don't know the titles. I don't know who's the Duke of what or whatever. I don't care. I support Meghan. I once stood <laughs> 20 feet away from Queen Lizzie mm-hmm. as a head student at my high school in Jamaica, and I have let all that go. I am not... <laughs> A royal subject, despite what I said Luke, on my Canadian, yes, you are. You are literally a... despite what I said <laughs> while swearing oath to Lilibet. Yeah, nine years ago. Well, that was a marathon TV section. It was. We understand this episode is going to be long, so feel free to pick and choose. We're doing this. I mean, because it's fun for us, and we never get to talk about culture in this way mm-hmm. without tennis. So, totally get it if it's not your cup of tea. At least not the whole thing. This is for us. That's what you're saying? <laughs> yes. Hopefully other people enjoy it. This is the gay section. Which every section is the gay section. This is us, a gay show. This is the gayest. Mm-hmm. So we talked earlier about how one of our favorite shows of the year was Heartstopper. And one of the main characters in that show is Kit Connor. I'll let you take this. This is a show where many of the actors are teenagers. It appeals to kids. It's about, you know, a coming out story, a teen gay romance. It's very sweet. It is extremely sweet and very sad. A lot of it is is sad and difficult because it reminded so many of us, uh, older gays. Of, Geriatric millennials. Mm, it, it created this nostalgia for something that we never had, right? mm-hmm. the, a teen romance. Like you get to see in, in teen shows all the time between a boy and a girl. Um, so it was... Uh, it was this mess of emotions, but it based off of a comic strip, comic book. Yeah, yeah, and it inspired a very loyal, vocal following. A stand dumb. Mm-hmm. It also dovetails with this cultural moment, this wider cultural moment where we're having all these discussions about: Is it okay for non queer actors to play queer roles? And those are legitimate conversations to have less so when you're involving teen actors right kids literal kids Kids. and so kit connor who is uh 18 or 19 at this point just 18 he was 17 when they were shooting right you look at older pictures of him and it's all baby fat like this is a kid yeah you go through his instagram don't have to go very far and he's a little boy you don't recognize him because he just grew out of puberty he's just now becoming a man and with that he is just now i would imagine in his real life coming to terms with dealing with discovering his own sexuality meanwhile you have all these trolls and horrendous hyenas people on the internet hounding him at every turn to find out if he is one of those straights Mm -hmm. that are benefiting from this wave of queer acceptance (laughs) that if he's building his career off of a straight man playing a gay role and it was something that he quite rightfully dodged in at every turn in the 
the media tour for this series. Until a couple months ago when he had left Twitter for a while and he came back just to say, quote, back for a minute, I'm by. Congrats for forcing an 18-year-old to out himself. I think some of you missed the point of the show. Bye. And that was, dear listeners, a heartbreaking tweet to read. It really was, because if you did watch the series, you get this heartwarming and very difficult journey of this kid trying to figure out who he is. And he's a teenager. Remember when you were 17? (laughs) And it's not like every 17-year-old is ready to stand up in front of the whole world and say, I am this. I'm proud. He was marching in pride parades with his friends, with his castmates, and people were accusing him of queer baiting. That's kind of where all this is coming from, right? People were hounding him so incessantly about his sexuality because they were saying, oh, we're tired of straight men playing gay characters, which, fine, is a thing. But not all of it is queer baiting. Not all of it is pretending to be gay, sort of making a mockery of gay love and gay sex to make money. That's what queer baiting is. Because wrapped up in that, if you are on that queer baiting train, wrapped up in that is this idea that it is now easy to be a queer person in the world. Exactly. And it is not. Let alone a teenager. We are, what, on the other side of 35. We come from different backgrounds. (laughs) Our experience growing up as queer kids was totally different. Yep. It is now... Thankfully, totally different for a vast majority. Well, not even. No. A lot of a lot of young queer kids in some places have it better, and that's great. Mm -hmm. But but still, it is a fraught experience for even the most fortunate of us in this situation. Yes. And the thing that I I really find troubling and bothers me, and I experience it in my daily life is that we have these so-called allies who take for granted that being gay, queer, lesbian, bi, trans, the entire alphabet, that it's easy. That it's not just easier, but that it's easy. Mm -hmm. And that they then get to speak to our experience unchecked. Right. And that is that is where this whole situation with Kit Connor really bugged me. Because it's not just queer people who created this vacuum of noise it's i think they think it is easy because it looks cool and it looks fun and wonderful and it's something to aspire to it is fun by the way (laughs) not everybody gets to have that but it is fun but it's not easy we've we've got in canada and the u.s far-right neo-nazi organizations showing up armed to drag shows for what? This is extremely dangerous. This is terrifying. Yeah, like, we're going to talk about this a bit later, but it reminds me of, you know, you're sampling bits of a culture that you are not part of, which, okay, we're not going to get into all of that. But you don't the, want... The appropriativeness right, of it. You don't want everything that comes with that culture. You want the cool parts, mm-hmm. right? You want to claim that AAVE is just Gen Z slang, You want to which feel- is not... You want to feel safe at your bachelorette party, so you go to a gay club. Right. Or you want to appropriate the stereotypes of what you think a black woman looks like, but you don't actually want to be a black woman in America, because that's hard. You want to sit there and enjoy this show and have a rooting interest for not just the character, but these people in real life. And so in order to fully stand Kit Connor's character, he has to be authentically gay himself as well. Yeah, I do hope we get to a point where we don't really have to talk about the actor's sexuality because I do understand the importance. I really do. Like, so many queer actors have just been erased over the history of Hollywood and just never given a chance because nobody thought they could do it, that they could play a diverse array of characters. And then, you know, when we actually have queer films, so many of them were populated by straight men, by Heath Ledger and Jake Gyllenhaal and guys who were super open-minded and with us, but still, you know, those could have been opportunities that weren't given to mm-hmm. queer folks. So, yes, it is important, but I hope it isn't always like this. This is also dovetailing with 
a generation of queer kids who do not feel the need to label themselves the ways that we did, the yeah. ways that we probably mm. still do. Identity politics don't mean the same to them as it does to us. And when that happens, there's this friction. There's this this feeding into this queer baiting mm -hmm. discourse. When in fact, it's it's none of our business. Right. I, I, I struggle with wanting to see that representation still because I, I, th I absolutely still think it's important and life-saving. But if there's a queer actor who doesn't feel like sharing that part of themselves, that has to be okay as well. Yeah. David Archuleta is in is older than Kit. He's in his early 30s. You may remember him from American Idol season. I don't remember, but he was on there with uh, David Cook. It was the two mm -hmm. David. I remember being at my parents' house and watching him perform Imagine. And that was the moment. I remember saying, they're going to eat that up. Like that oh. was, that was good. Spoon fed. Right. Him. He's got a beautiful tone to his voice. He grew up Mormon. But this is also the kid who was very early on, on a national stage, singing, and I'm telling you I'm not going. Really? Yeah. I don't remember that one. He, he had a <laughs> lot of really historically gay vocal moments uh, in like his repertoire. Gay coded songs. As a kid. Mm. And so I watched him on this show, and years afterward, I would follow him on social media and whatnot, and I would, I saw the signs, you know, <laughs> like, and it's not, I'm never, I'm absolutely one of these people to push back every single time, when especially yeah. a straight person says, oh, well, I knew, or a gay person says, oh, I knew, somebody comes out and like, oh, well, you didn't have to tell me, like, well, yeah, they actually did. Do you want, because it was important for them. Do you want an award? And it's not about you. It's like, okay, you you won. You won my coming out. Congratulations. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Kennedy Center Honors. Wow. Amazing. And what a moment. You'll need to really stop it with Shawn Mendes. Because I, I admit, I have partaken in a little joke or two. You partook? I partook, but it needs to stop. And I cannot do it. Because Sean Mendez, if he is straight, gay, whatever, queer, right now he he says he's straight, and he's an example of an actually like kind and kind of soft, straight man, problematic. where a, a basically an expression of his gender that straight men should feel comfortable being that should aspire like, toward homophobia is bad for straight men too like, like this is misogyny. something that we should want writ large for right? everybody like misogyny is bad for straight men too it makes their lives worse i'll say this to <laughs> over and over anyway like the horror you go to a film with your bestie and your hands touch while you're reaching for the popcorn you are homosexuals for life <laughs> <laughs> like the or the, your your voice sounds a certain way. It's the like, lack of intimacy that straight men police for themselves. Well, it's it's, actually, it's heartbroken. It's, it's heartbreaking. Sad. Yes. And so I sat there in silence, except for talking to you over the years. Oh, with Archuleta, with yeah. David. Saw okay. him. Saw him go on to do his missionary work. Saw him being engaged, doing all these things, avoiding questions. Blah blah blah. And then this year, I think, or maybe at the end of last year, he comes out as queer. He says he's queer. Yeah. Wasn't ready to be specific about what that meant for him. He's since been more specific. Yes. He was uh, engaged to three women mm -hmm. on three separate occasions. He's evolved uh, to the point where he can make jokes about it. <laughs> I sent you that last night, mm -hmm. right? You saw that? So I find it interesting uh, kind of going through this journey with someone who we knew when he was 17 and who had a very religious upbringing and is sort of trying to unpack all those things without giving up his faith. Uh, and I'm not someone who has faith, like I'm not a believer, um, but I, I just find his, the way he talks about it really interesting. There's an element of it that's still trying to pander to his prior fan base, which I get. Yeah, and it's fraught. It's difficult for him, and you can see it. Because it's not just pandering to his fan base, it's also kind of pandering to his former self. Mm. You, you're watching this play out in real time. Mm -hmm. And so this is where we as a public 
a viewing and a listening public need to grant him the grace to exist and be who he is now as authentically for himself to make him feel safe. But I will say he just released a video. I think it's something like Have a Little Faith in Me or something where he does this Ferris Bueller-esque dancing romp Mm -hmm. through the streets. And closeted David Archuleta did not dance like that before. No, And that type of joy as a newly out queer person is so uplifting Mm -hmm. to see. And he remains a vocal talent and an adorable, dare I say, cute (laughs) person. (laughs) Next on the list, you have bros. And I feel that there has been almost too much discourse about this movie and not much about the actual movie, which I would say I enjoyed, but I did not love. Um, I wish I could have seen it without all the extras, mm. right? Because I, to start with, we both dislike Billy Eichner to a, well, to a degree. He you know, is, that's the thing. When I told you that I just uh, dislike annoying people, he is right up there. Yeah, well, yeah <laughs> right. I know you really don't like Billy. I just... Billy Eichner as the lead of the supposedly major groundbreaking romantic comedy with a huge marketing budget and everything. Self-proclaimed groundbreaking movie. It didn't make sense. Like, I don't know how you expect this film to make 50 million, 100 million at the box office with no stars. In this COVID era. Right. Nobody's, Nobody's going to the movies, least of which to see romantic comedies. And... It was just, it felt so corporate. It felt like, oh, this, we're insisting that this is groundbreaking. And in many ways it was, you know, almost the entire cast was queer. T. Madison was in it. A lot of great, hilarious actors. And there was so much to like about it. But the central romance, I just really like, I couldn't really get into it. But also when it becomes a bit of a flop after the first week in release, you lay the blame at the feet of all queer people who did not support their queer brethren. Well, and all straight people for being homophobic. Oh my god. Like maybe- it was <laughs> it was a dumpster fire of PR for this film. Yes. So I cannot imagine that the studio was happy with how Billy was tweeting after the the opening weekend. Got because these romantic comedies and smaller movies like this, they need word of mouth, right? So just say, okay, the opening weekend wasn't what we'd hoped, but people are liking it. The reviews were mostly very positive, actually. Do you know and- how many of Mariah's early albums did not debut <laughs> at number one? Yes. That did not sell even 300,000 copies in the first week in the height of the Sunscan era? I was shocked. Do you know how many? Because, because listen, I just saw a tweet that said... Drake is the first artist to have 10 number one singles and 10 number one albums. And I went to Wikipedia and I said, chart data, you have got to be wrong about this. No. No. Mariah has six number one albums. That's it. She's got an album that sold six million copies without ever hitting number one. She's got diamond albums. Bitch. Merry Christmas never took the number one spot on the album chart. and The holiday album market was different back then. But but still... The millions that that album has sold since then? Right. No, but anyway, the point is, with the word of mouth, back then she would release a debut album, a debut single off of Emotions, and then, you know, by week 10, week 12, momentum would build. Right. And then it would become a hit. Let, let this thing ruminate for a minute. It's Sunday night. And he's like, well, all of you homophobes killed the movie. Dude, just give it a little time. It felt like he was dropping oh the F God. word a lot. <laughs> with those tweets. <laughs> you bleeps. Oh, oh that, that effort. <laughs> because yeah. the reviews were good. They were. Yeah. You go to Rotten Tomatoes, it had like 85 plus. It had, he had Queen Mariah at his premiere. She wore a bro's dress for him. Like there were a lot of positive things going for this thing. And he could not get out of his way. To derail this stuff. Well, I mean, that is kind of Billy's brand, though. That's the character that he created for himself. I don't know what he's like in real life, but Billy on the street. I mean, he was in a series called Difficult People, where he played a difficult person. He seems like the most (laughs) difficult. (laughs) On the other hand, I don't want to compare gay films, but Fire Island was what I needed. Mm -hmm. You know, a Pride and Prejudice kind of 
spoof, uh, you know, an ad- a loose adaptation, the lead characters who were not white. Because you cannot keep telling us that this film is so groundbreaking, that Bros <laughs> is so groundbreaking, and you have two cis white men as the leads, and one of them is like absurdly hot, like mm-hmm. a muscle daddy, you know? Come on. It's 2022. And then we have folks who go to watch Fire Island and then tell us that, well, I didn't see myself reflected in that. Well, babe, maybe you weren't supposed to. What an experience. (laughs) What an experience. (laughs) Truly. That is very narrow-minded to me because I've talked about this on this show before. There's something about specificity in art that can make you feel something about yourself. Right? I've seen so many shows and movies where I'm not reflected. Mm -hmm. And... Even though I, I don't know these people's experiences, it's telling me something about myself, right? Why does Dreamgirls resonate with so many gays? <laughs> Why? Right, what about right. that and maybe, are you able to relate to? And maybe that's a self-centered way to receive art. But, you know, there's something, spe- there's something universal about the specific when you do it well. When you tell a story about real humans. This past weekend, last Friday, six days ago... You and I were in the audience of the Queen of Christmas, Miss Mariah Carey. Mm -hmm. Unofficial. Unauthorized. But she'll take it. Her first Toronto show. Uh Uh-huh. She's playing, at this point, she played two Toronto Christmas shows, and then she's played one of two already in New York City in her home state, in her home city at Madison Square Garden. Four total, and there will be a, a special on CBS sometime next week that'll have footage i assume spliced together from all four yeah, shows like the best footage from all of them mm-hmm. and i am so glad that we went to the first show because from going to the second one by myself because mm-hmm. you went to both <laughs> i scored an 80 dollar ticket 80 dollar canadian ticket to the second show and at that point i couldn't not go <laughs> it would be a dereliction of duty as a card-carrying member of the Lamely, mm-hmm. to not go. But that first show was, it was it. And the two subsequent ones have not been that. Yeah, that's too bad. So, before you start with all the lip-syncing and whatever, we are lambs, and we can hear. So we know we know the trickery that artists do. We know that everybody uses backing tracks... We know when Mariah is singing live and when she's not, because the high belts are typically not her. Because you know what her high belt sounds like now. It's different. The tone is different. So she she uses some help in her shows. But in the Christmas show, this was, in my view, the least amount of help that I've seen mm. in all the shows. I've seen her maybe five or six times. I've seen her about eight times. Yeah, at least. And she did a ton of live singing. Live whistles. I think maybe some, like a few of the whistles, maybe were lipped or were enhanced, but a lot of them were live. Right, but the thing with Mariah. It's not 21 year old Mariah. Like, get over it. But the thing is with Mariah, when she hits a note, it's always going to be allegations. Because (laughs) when Mariah hits a note, the tone, the natural OG tone, is so otherworldly that it's not to be believed as real. Right. The woman has had vocal nodules for years. Decades. And will not get them removed because she's afraid of like a Julie Andrews situation, mm-hmm. which is uh, one of the mo- the worst musical tragedies, aside from deaths, of our lifetime. Julie Andrews, the voice of a century. Mm-hmm. You know, let's talk about that. But anyway, Mariah will not get the surgery, so her voice does sustain damage. And she needs to take very specific care of it. We had a great time on that Friday. It was yes, an incredible show, notwithstanding you almost trying to fight. I did. <laughs> I told someone to be quiet. No, you said, shut the fuck up. They did not hear me. <laughs> they could not hear me. These, no. You're really bringing this up right now because like. I knew you is, didn't want me to put this, this on the show. This is not who I am anymore. Like, I'm so chill now. It's not? This, I didn't. Honestly, I think I, you surprised yourself. I think you I did. thought you weren't that person anymore. I did anymore. surprise myself because I don't... This was a younger version of me. <laughs> the version when we were in L.A. in 2008. Right. Like stupid. In 2008. Right? 
14 years ago and we're in a not so great part of the city and you're trying to like bang on cars and flip mm-hmm. people the finger. That is a lot. <laughs> bang on cars. I mean, I'm not stupid. Like I may have let my anger take over, but I would not bang on a Somebody car. did you dirty as a pedestrian and you did something that alarmed yes, well, me. You do, as a pedestrian, you do need to take care of yourself. And I, <laughs> I stand by that. But no, I, I am not proud. I was surprised with myself. Mm. But these, this group of white women were on the floor seats. We spent a lot of money, right? And we never spend money like this on concerts. We're in the, on the floor seats. There are four seats that are empty. And you know. I said to you, I said to you. Some annoying like, people are going to come late. DJ Sus1 starts at 8, <laughs> does his half hour set, talking about, oh, where my ladies at? Where my ladies at? And like, dude. Babe. What's not clicking? It's gays and ladies. We're gay here. here. Like, this is a gay show. <laughs> And some, like, 40 to 50-year-old woman. Right, which they're welcome. More than Yeah, welcome. absolutely. But this is at least a 40% visibly oh, gay yeah. show. Queer, trans, everything. But these women came late. They were annoying. They were... If you're, like, singing along and having fun, that's cool. That's what you're supposed to do at mm-hmm. a concert. If you're, like, telling a story to your friends and screaming while Miss Monroe Cannon Carey is making her stage debut... I was ready to fight. I was so mad. No, well... Yes. Okay. Okay, that's not exactly what happened. <laughs> what? You need to stop with the spitting. The spit takes... <laughs> uh, that's a deep cut for one person in particular. Uh, so, I said to you, this is like, the show's supposed to start at 8, Sus1 comes out, plays till 8.30 DJing, Mariah comes out around 9, fine, we expect that. Mm-hmm. That's- this is like 9.40, those seats are still empty, and I say to you, watch. Mm-hmm. It's like, I'm pretty sure this show is sold out, there's some mess happening no. when those always, seats get filled. If the seats are empty, the most annoying people you've mm-hmm. ever met in your life mm-hmm. will take them. And then it was their seats, like they were ushered to the seats. Yeah, and so they come in... And they're carrying on. I have decided to block them out. You clearly were not able to. But then Mariah says, I'm going to play this song that's a request. And I want you to know that I've listened to you. And I'm going to play something I've never played before. And I was like, surely not. Surely not. Miss you most at Christmas time. I am beside myself. And in the middle of Mariah singing it, and singing it live that mm-hmm. first night, yeah. there you are, there being I like, am. shh, shh, shh. <laughs> and then when they're not paying attention, you're like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> that is a lie. That is lies <laughs> on top of lies. I mean, this is like a two-minute max they performance even, of this song. They didn't even hear and me. I'm like, what is, go- what is going on? What is going on? And then so I say to you, can you please just, let's just switch seats. Let's switch seats. Then I, we were on the aisle. I was on the far end and you were right beside me. I put you on the other side. I was like, we're just going to keep it moving. What people must think of me now. <laughs> like, and when we got home, I was like, I'm actually really embarrassed because I, I did think that that part of me was over. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. I haven't acted like that in years. Like this was literally a once in a moment experience. That we will never exactly. experience is, again. Wait, but which is precisely why I was so mad. I understand, right? which, but you weren't able to get out of your own way. Exactly. And I think that's that's such a illuminating moment for our personalities, I think. Mm-hmm. I, I think so. I'm able to block out because a was, lot more shit than you are. I was really trying. Like, I was trying, believe Where it or not. Where are you, though? No. <laughs> just, something just takes over. Uh, but no, anger is not an attractive quality. It really isn't. It's not cute. Like, I don't find it funny. I don't find my behavior funny. Mm. I would have liked to tap her on the shoulder and said, Hi, I'm so sorry. Would you mind just <laughs> keeping it down? Being, like, really Canadian. I should have been very Canadian about it. And not Rochester. Darlene Love, lo- I'll tell you. I told mm. you privately. That tell us publicly the, now. The Phil Spector girls, they're going to scrap. Like, mm. they are not to be trifled with. The Ronettes... Always had this reputation for being, you know, those are girls yeah. from the Bronx. They were rough. They could take care of themselves. Listen, this was a woman who heard her song on the radio while cleaning somebody else's house. It, Watch 20 Feet from Stardust. Yes. 
Darlene Love is an absolute legend. There will be no slander here no. about her legacy and her contribution to music. However, I didn't I didn't love the things that she was saying about Mariah, of course. But this is an elder black woman who's achieved a lot and hasn't been recognized enough. So I'm going to give her a bly. Yeah. And Mariah is on record. That's been circulating from years ago mm-hmm. of giving her her flowers. Yes. <laughs> Mariah is a music historian. Right. Like, her mom, I'm sure, was spinning the Phil Spector Christmas album in the 60s and 70s. Like The first Merry Christmas album is an ode to the Phil course. Spector sound of music. It's that timeless, that wall of sound of music. And unfortunately, Phil Spector was a violent misogynist and a murderer. But the contribution is, mm. you know. Are you ready for this part of the show? Yeah. I mean, we're what? The raw audio file is 100 minutes into this recording. And mm. this is where we will lose probably 50% of our <laughs> listenership. <laughs> no, I'm not going to be mean. The topic is... You're not going to be mean? No. This has bothered you and bedeviled you and haunted you for 13 years. Oh, well, Okay, well, we'll test my definition of mean then. Uh, what's the topic? We need to talk about Taylor Swift. Because this has gone on entirely too long. And I said, did we? Do we? It's a pop culture episode, and she has made herself ever-present again. Let I me mean, tell you. she Nobody sells like Taylor. She, uh, the, I, I, you know, there's no arguing with her reach, with her sales, her popularity. Fine, but I'm saying I just don't understand well, it. That This is where Back I was going. Back in 2008, 2009, I was, if you had told me then that this would be carrying on, that this woman would be for the 13 years pop star that this was not a fad i was convinced at that time like okay i can withstand this i can deal with this <laughs> mm. but like i never understood or believed in the pop star that she's yeah. become i didn't anticipate that she mm. would evolve so much but when she started you know that carrie underwood country pop was big like she could ride that wave she's a young girl she's thinking about young girl stuff not really my bag, but like, what do I care? I you mean, know, it's I, never it's never been for us. No, to but be clear, way back then, when she was like seventeen, I don't care. I don't care what she's thinking about. Like, I I don't begrudge her that it was a little problematic. You know, the virgin whore kind of dichotomy. I didn't love it, but again, it's not really my world. And still, <laughs> still, now she sold ten gazillion records. She got diamond albums, number one singles. Um, really, she sells more than anyone in in the pop game currently. Yeah. Adele is the only one, even even in the same conversation. And Drake, at a thirty plus year old at this point, is that how old she is? Yeah, thirty plus 30s. year old. This many years into her career, she has such a knack and a talent for pitting herself as a victim. <laughs> that has been the one the one through line in her career that she has never let go of. And to to, to be fair to her, it was often put upon her. Yeah. You know, like the Kanye West thing was, it was fucked up. Yes. <laughs> hmm. And then... I'm just being hmm. constantly sold this idea that she is a generational talent. A singer-songwriter in the mold of a Joni Mitchell? Don't, don't, do not utter Joni's name here. What on earth? Joan. What on earth? Let me tell you, this new single, Antihero... It is one of the worst number one singles I've ever heard in my entire life. You are so rude. Uh, no, I'm not even... Like, I I gave it an earnest shot. I listened to it multiple times. And then when she comes on with that sexy baby line, like... It, the, it gets very Dr. Seuss with all the rhyming. It's, it's not good. It's not, not great, Bob. When I was 10 years old in Jamaica... I'm pretty sure I sent away to some poetry competition in the U.S. to become part of some book. To have my... my you know, it's like the publishing clearinghouse, the, the Columbia Music oh, Catalog yeah, yeah. of Poetry. We, we did that too, yeah. Yeah. And you the only criteria poem. was you rhymed. That's what this song is. <laughs> That's what... I, I, oh, I have enjoyed some of her songs. The song with the now problematic lead singer of... Death Cab for Cutie. What's his name? The Panic at the Disco. Panic at the Disco. <laughs> Brendan <laughs> Urie. <laughs> I know that I I loathed that song. I know you did, but I liked it. 
because uh, I do enjoy his voice. You have you you have a question for me here to like come a challenge to come up with Taylor songs that I like, and I told you're being the messy one here. You said Antihero was like one of the worst number one songs you ever heard. It is. And I would challenge you to go through the list of number ones because they're like a lot, a lot of shit. Is it worse than Macarena? I don't think so. <laughs> Leave, first of all, leave Macarena is it, out. Is of it this. worse than Lou Bega, Mambo Number no. Five? I don't know. There, there are a lot of novelty songs in the in the Hot 100. But the thing with Taylor is like we've heard the the Jack Antonoff production for a decade. You're gonna get academic about no, it. No, I mean we. This is this is sort of that millennial sound, right? Mm. We've heard it before. Didn't really love it then in 2013. It sounds the same to me in 2022. It's like when Justin Timberlake recorded Mirrors, mm. uh, what, in 2011 or 12? And I'm like, this this song was definitely on Future Sex Love Sounds. Like, it was, it was so derivative. It was such clearly trading on his previous sound, which is fine, I guess. But, like, I'm just... I, for me, you're you're free to like whatever you want. I'm not saying she's obviously very talented, very savvy. It's just not for me. I'm not very saying, savvy. I'm still unsold on the talent. I'm just I'm not with the Jack Antonoff thing. Don't like the sound at all. I also think there is a certain level of white feminism wrapped up into her music. As your eyes bug out. Well, you remember, like, the Taylor Squad? You talked about finding universality in a very specific type of art with respect to the gay stuff yes. earlier. I could not find universality in this. But it's there, apparently. It's oh. it's the culture. Well, honestly, like, who are we to even criticize? Because, like, her reach is broad. This it's is what profound. I'm saying. It's like, clearly not it, for us. But it... I mean, but it is for white gays. For me. Like, it's supposed to be my demographic. No, sweetie, you're too old for that. No, no. Um, I you, think you are. Have you been on Twitter? I think the combination of my influence and the length of our relationship and your age. What are you talking about your influence? You think if we had never met, I'd be like a Taylor Swift gay? No. Absolutely no. not. Because I'm you saying... know what I was listening to in high school. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyway, it no, but it is it is for me. Like for elder millennial white gays, they're all Swifties, all of them, all of them, all of them. Mm. And I simply I don't get it. I'm just I don't get it. I don't. I get think it. the privilege of you being a year younger than me is shining out. <laughs> <laughs> we are the same age, the both of us. We're old. Sure. So the only Taylor song that I kind of liked was. Um, we're never, ever, ever getting back together. Okay. That's pretty much it. I mean, I'm sure there are a few that I've, like, hummed along to in the car until I realized what was going on. Somebody was trying to sue her over Shake It Off, and I was like, is this, is Mariah behind this? (laughs) (laughs) It got dismissed, apparently. I mean, that's not a terrible song, but I will never support it because there's only one Shake It Off. Well, and then there's two, and then there's three. There's the Florence and the Machine mm. Shake It Off, too, which is totally different. Anyway, or is it Shake It Out or Shake It Off? I don't remember. Anyway. It's just too much. Like, I don't understand why this is still going on, and it's not going to end anytime soon. <laughs> I'm told by the history of music that women over 40 don't be, aren't well, successful yeah. anymore. Which sucks. Which it is sucks, terrible, right? But I'm banking on it in this case. What? <laughs> wow. I think Joni Mitchell is on your side. Oh, she is? Has she said something? Well, there, you know, people were saying if there's a Joni Mitchell biopic, like who who should play you? Mercy. What do you think about Taylor Swift? And she said she doesn't have a voice. I mean, that's not even a read. Joni Mitchell has an incredible voice. And, you know, Joni is different. She's Stevie Wonder level genius. Like, she's different. Right? This is this is not a pop star. This is a, a totally other level. Anyway. Yeah, so please don't cancel us. If you've already contributed to our GoFundMe, please don't file a complaint. <laughs> <laughs> it's just something that we've 
I, in particular, have just needed to get off my chest for a while. Mm. I'm, I've been held captive for over a decade, and I'm all for everybody having their fun, but this just feels oppressive at this point. Oh, okay. Now, to give a more, and I think you know, specific insight into what our musical interests are and why, you know, Miss Swift might not be our bag, there's one word in quotation marks that's next on the agenda, and it's Superwoman. And we could literally do an entire series on just that one word. <laughs> on just that one on word. The, the covers of Superwoman by these super groups of singers. Yeah. This was inspired by recently Patti LaBelle, who is 76, 77 years old. She appears at this award show flanked by Queen Latifah to her left and Jennifer Hudson. And then on her right, Yolanda Adams and Fantasia Barino. I saw a tweet the other day about how saying like if Yolanda had chosen the streets... Uh, instead of singing about the Lord, it would have been over for you. <laughs> for so many of these She R&B shows up singers. every now and then <laughs> to do a secular song in tribute. Like, And these five women sing in a segment that's in tribute to Patti LaBelle, Superwoman, which was originally recorded by Karen White in 1988 or 89. And then there was a remake by Gladys Knight, Patti LaBelle, and Dionne Warwick. A couple years later, they appeared on the Oprah Winfrey show. Gladys's subsequent album that featured that song, it was produced by Michael Powell, who produced the entire Rapture album by Anita Baker, which is easily top five greatest R&B album in history. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And so you have all this backstory to this performance. Patti LaBelle still here at 76, 77 years old. Happy to take the high notes. Park and bark, as they say. And everybody else knows their place. Latifah is off to the right, and she's just, she's harmonizing. (laughs) You know, I don't Mm. think I heard. I really couldn't hear her in the blend. I couldn't hear her at all. Mm. But she was there. Fantasia Barino. My God. What a talent still. Unreal. Ridiculous. And these are five women who know how to sing in an ensemble. That's this is what's missing. So people Except want... except for Queen, the other four would blow the roof right. off any house without prompting. They could, but they're not, right? They're and... all operating within this collection of greatness, right. right? They all know what they need to do. And Jennifer is the one who is most apt to, like, blow the roof off if she gets a chance. But this is, you know, a lot of people on TikTok and YouTube are always talking about what's missing with the pop singers these days. And that it's because they didn't grow up in church. They didn't learn how to sing. They didn't learn technique. And there's a lot of, there really is a lot of truth to that. All of these women have powerful voices, but they blended really beautifully and they know, like, when you're called upon, okay, do your thing, and then sit back again. And the, you, they also know how to make them st- make themselves stand out even while in the background, mm-hmm. while doing just enough. It's not do- that chaos, absolute bedlam of that Aretha tribute a few years ago with mm. Christina. Oh, boy. Yolanda Florence, was in it. Florence. Florence, Martina McBride. Girl, it was... It was a nightmare. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of screaming and a lot of people trying to one-up each other. No. Mm -mm. Not for Aretha, no. Because Aretha didn't need to even try to one-up. And she would never have allowed herself to be (laughs) one-upped by anybody. (laughs) Well, there's people argue that Celine did it at the Divas Live thing, but... Well, she attempted. She she sure did. As a, what, 30-year-old woman... To taking on a 50 something year old woman. Mm-hmm. Congrats. Yes. Anyways, I want to highlight this song because it's never been one of your favorites. Truthfully, you've never liked it. And this is not just not to throw you under the mm-hmm. bus. Well, it's but 30 years. You know, maybe not the, the feminist anthem that I was looking for. Okay, fine. <laughs> but 30 plus years later, there's a reason why the great black woman singers of any generation yeah still come and to they this clearly song connect with it karen white was really big in jamaica right very big yeah um okay let's move on truly horrible news 
this past week, Celine Dion announced that she's been just diagnosed with stiff person syndrome. And when I tell you when I first saw the headlines surrounding this, I thought it was some kind of Onion article. Yeah, that you know, it's a people very are, strangely named disease. Yeah, and like I could see where somebody would make fun of Celine for being kind of stiff mm. in her like appearance, you know, on a performance or whatever. It didn't make sense to me. And then I, when I watched her video, it was just, it was too much. Yeah, it's a very rare neurological disease and it can cause like stiff muscles. It can cause spasms. And especially when someone is startled or there's loud noises or something, they can go into like these spontaneous muscle spasms. So as a performer, you can imagine that's very difficult. And there are treatments uh, apparently, you can take anticonvulsants and some other treatments, uh, diazepam. Some of the treatments are quite painful, apparently. But Celine said, you know, I'm I'm canceling the tour this year, but I do plan to reschedule in 2024. She's somebody who would have access to the greatest health care. This, it's just, it's hard to hear about, you know, a living legend who's still very much doing her thing. To think that in her not even mid-50s, this could be it for her as a performing artist. Set aside what it means for her day-to-day life. This complete upheaval of who it is to be her. Just a few short years away from her husband and her brother dying, Mm -hmm. I think within months of each other. Like, this woman has been through a lot. And you talked earlier about Julie, Julie Andrews and what a calamitous loss that was for the music industry this this is one of the all-time greats yeah period and i liken it to what we talk about on our regular tennis show where tennis greats retire and struggle with retiring and in the case of juan martin del potro having it taken away from him prematurely and having to make Mm -hmm. peace with not being able to do what he's always done and done so well so many iterations of heartbreak and how that can manifest with not being able to do what you've always done, be it retirement or injury or illness, and it's never not sad. The next section of the show... Also sad. Is it? Because the chokehold that they have on on the culture, mm. that's sad. Depressing more than sad. <laughs> Depressing. It, the, 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 what's written here is Kardashian's colon... When will it end? <laughs> I, you put this on here because we ended up talking about it at Thanksgiving. It, you know, we were making some profound points at one in the morning. I was like, I don't want to talk about this on here. I'm not the best person to speak on this by a long shot. You never give yourself enough credit <laughs> for the things and the acumen that you have to bring to the conversation. Okay, thank you. Um yeah, I the conversation was about like, well, what what is the Kardashian Jenner phenomenon? Why did it happen, and why does it persist? Because the longevity is impressive. I will give them that. Did you know? I just learned today that we have Ryan Seacrest to thank for this. Ryan Seacrest pitched Keeping Up with the Kardashians to E, and he produced it. Why? Wasn't he busy enough with American Idol? Mm. And then he has his morning show. Does he still do like? Regis and Ryan and Ryan he took and over for Regis, yeah. Well, well, didn't Michael Strahan for a while, and then well, he did. There, there was a feud. I'll tell you, my grandmother would be spinning in her grave. <laughs> she loved Regis and Kelly. Mm. She loved Regis and Kathy Lee too. Regis and anyone. Anyway, the Kardashian thing. Like, I'm not gonna go through the whole. You know, right? But this thing. family, this fucking family, the Kanye West who has gone into this family through his Chris Jenner who produced her daughter's sex tape, who then precipitated this whole mess. Then we got Caitlyn, who... Caitlyn fucking Jenner. Who could have been... A transformative figure. For trans people. And no, she never changed. She, she was always a conservative Republican, still a conservative Republican, and she loves Donald Trump, and she completely sucks. But in the meantime, we have a decade of the Kardashians nipping and tucking and coloring and blackfacing and performing blackness 
to their advantage. Yeah, so that's what I really want to talk about is their appearance and how it's evolved. So, you know, the the main Kardashian sisters, Courtney, Kim, Chloe, gone through a lot of iterations in their appearance. There was the BBLs. They've popularized so many looks, so many cosmetic surgeries and looks for young women. Their reach is just crazy. Like, it's unbelievable how influential they are. And I don't really understand it. But these are, you know, Armenian and white women. Chloe's parentage is... Um, Questionable. Apparently is still being discussed. If the glove doesn't fit. <laughs> but these are these are women who put on all of the stereotypes of black womanhood. They were never black themselves, of course. Nope. But uh, I was... I actually encountered... You know um, Tressie McMillan Cottom? Mm -hmm. You've seen her like on Twitter and stuff. So she's on TikTok now. She's on a, where now? <laughs> she's on TikTok now. <laughs> she's a, a professor at UNC Chapel Hill, I believe. And she was talking about uh, a doctoral student who's working on something about how some people are allowed to transgress these social boundaries. And in this case, the boundary is race, right? So some people are allowed to put on the looks, the signifiers, the, the visual aspects of what another race is. And they're rewarded. They're given status and, and money and fame and celebrity and TV shows and makeup lines. And, you know, the younger, the Jenner generation, Kylie especially, has taken what we sh I think we should call black fishing to truly another level. And the professor you're referring to right now mentioned her own piece that went viral mm -hmm. when she wrote about Miley Cyrus. Yes, yes. And so this is another good example whereby somebody coming from a completely different genre says, well, you know, I'm no longer the Disney princess. I'm no longer Miss Country. I'm going to become hard edge. I need a hard edge. I need people right. to take me. I need people to be, you know, thinking like, oh, that girl, she's got, she's a little bit dangerous. Mm -hmm. and, and what better to signify danger in American culture than to associate yourself with blackness. Exactly. But you don't have to suffer the consequences and the surveillance and the gaze of whiteness when you put that on. Yes. Right? Yes. So Miley dabbled. Right? She dabbled in hip-hop and black culture. She's now, she's a, she's a rock girl. She's a country girl. And Miley is so talented. Like, she can do a lot of things. Um, I be, you know, I believe in her as a musician. But the, uh, the sojourn into into blackness felt like a joke it felt like mm. she was mocking it didn't it did not feel sincere because Cher said it actually Cher said okay like i'm not offended because it was it was lewd i'm offended because it was not good mm. yeah. <laughs> i mean that is a read like that's a word she because said because Cher it has been good. arguably lewd many times right. in her career but miley couldn't dance she couldn't twerk People credit, are crediting her with bringing twerking into the American mainstream. What was that? I didn't see any twerking. I mean, <laughs> does white mediocrity need greatness? Well, exactly. But the point was it was... To, that. like, usher itself into <laughs> the main sphere. Mm -hmm. And the thing with the Kardashian thing is I don't even get into all that, like, famous for being famous. Because I don't think that's new, Particular, no, like, it's not. I, you know, I don't even think it was new in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. I think those sorts of famous for being famous people or tabloid fodder, those people always existed. So I don't want to make this into something simplistic like that. I get why reality stars would be famous uh, or influencers or whatever. Like, this is where we live in. It's the nature of hope. Yeah. And I'm not complaining about that. What I'm complaining about is, like, the content that they're putting out sucks. And it's actually damaging. Yeah, what have they done? What materially have they contributed to the cultural landscape? Have they contributed to like, oh, no, 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 honey. Not a white refrigerator. <laughs> like, do you ever see them being memed? Yeah, actually. I Maybe I'm just like ignoring them altogether. But like, it is truly baffling. But getting back to Dr. McMillan Cottom's point mm -hmm. is that she was saying like, some people take on... Or, or they transgress these boundaries 
in this case of race, and they get rewarded and other people are trapped by those categories, right? And they they live in a place of low social status, of low socioeconomic status. And so the thing is, like, the Kardashians are not black, and black women, a lot of black women would say, like, what are you talking about? That's not what we look like. Like, it's insulting to say that they are trying to be black. And that's not what I'm saying. It's a stereotype. It's a mockery. It's, you know, it's a, a caricature. I'm not saying that they're imitating real human black women. They're taking bits and pieces of culture and stereotype black hairstyles. Of course, not not all black women have these shapes, but these are the shapes. These shapes have, like, taken on signification in our culture, right? I'm not saying that it's fair. I'm saying that it's weird, and they're taking on these appearances to attract black men, have children with them, get rid of them. Some of them go right wing, some of them turn into Nazis. Like, I can't explain it. But and then now, they can come. They're all taken out their BBLs. Mm -hmm. They're all whiter now. Ariana Grande, to a lesser extent, talked with a black scent for two straight years. She was Asian for a spell. She was dark. Do you remember how dark mm -hmm. she painted herself? And now all of a sudden, so then she was Korean for a little while. Now she's white. So the point is that these white women can put on these masks and be whatever color and race they want to be and, and gain social status and make a ton of money from it. And I'm not saying anything that's new or anything that's no. profound, nope. but I, I just kind of had to get it out. And to relate to our regular audience, you have all these Eastern European women putting in box braids. At the end of their season, I mean, Yelena Ostapenko knows still with her box braids. That woman took, I mean, it looks like ropes that she found in some random canoe. I and think they just said on her, Twitter that it was carpet fiber. It, it's horrendous. And her scalp is going to be weeping. As it should. <laughs> and so these women can dabble. They can do their little vacation dabble. But I know when I was fresh out of high school and before I went to moved to Canada, I worked as a bank teller at Scotia Bank in Jamaica. And you could not have box braids. Mm -hmm. You could not, could not have braids working mm -hmm. as a bank teller in Jamaica because yeah. that was not seen as appropriate to the institution, to the whiteness, to the colonial structure mm -hmm. of business, the business world in Jamaica. And this is in a, a black country. This is in a black country. Like, you, you needed to have your hair straightened. But Miss Yelena Yostapenko <laughs> can come in on her vacation to Kingston, Jamaica, and co and cash a check in her box braids with the teller who is forced to have her hair straightened. So, I actually, you know, we were supposed to ask each other questions or whatever. And so I did have a question for you that kind of came up around this. I didn't ask you mine either. Oh, no. Let's so, end the show with this. Okay. So, starting from the place where... As a white man, I'm not I'm not the arbiter of what is cultural appropriation, what is cool. Like, it's not my decision. It's not my fight, right? Mm -hmm. Even if I care about these things, like, I can't be the one that makes that decision. But what I'm curious about is your position on white people enjoying pieces of entertainment like The Real Housewives of Atlanta or Potomac. Shows that are black-led, almost exclusively black, where you watch women fight with each other, mm -hmm. you know, not always be their best selves. Mm -hmm. Is it problematic, trademark, for white people to sit here and like kiki and laugh about it? Less so if there's an awareness of what you're participating in. Tracy McMillan Cottom said it in her TikTok video that you're allowed to enjoy things, you know? <laughs> like right. right. We are people who consume culture. We Just because you're a white person doesn't mean that you should only enjoy white culture. They should only listen to Taylor Swift. Branch out. <laughs> Be a superwoman. It becomes a problem when that becomes your identity. Mm. That's where the appropriation comes in, right? Like You can have this cognizant coexistence between you know watching something that, that's maybe not explicitly made for you that's not of your culture but something that you can still enjoy and then also not try and replicate it not mm -hmm. try and have that become your identity not try and cosplay it not try and culture face it 
blackface it, mm-hmm. <laughs> whatever the way the way that you take it on to be, right? Like you can you can sit there and have a laugh and drink and have a have your dinner and enjoy it, and not try to be the fan of Real Housewives of Atlanta on Twitter. Right. Do you know what or I mean? Not, like, not telling Nini what her experience exactly. is. Exactly. You, you can yeah. sit there on your couch in silence and enjoy it. There's nothing wrong with that. It's made for a reason. Ratings need to be had. <laughs> mm. it, it becomes when you try to take bits from that culture, that viewing experience, and benefit from it in some way. It's not right. just. Right. It's not just that you enjoy it. It's that you're going to take some of the catchphrases and then every second tweet, even if you're just talking about tennis, every second tweet is a GIF or a reaction. Exactly. And we've talked about digital blackface and digital minstrelsy, which are like relatively recent kind of, I mean, they're new terms based on very, very old concepts, like very profoundly American concepts too. Yeah, it's, it's just sort of interesting to me as like I changed the way that I've acted on social media, that I've rethought certain things that I've said or posted. Uh, What about like, um, so African-American vernacular English, AAVE, has become very popular among Gen Z so much that a lot of mainstream media outlets are just calling it Gen Z slang. A lot of these things are almost impossible to avoid. So it's just, it's an interesting balance to like, you know, live in the world and try to keep up with the kids and not also appropriate someone else's experience or culture. There's also kind of a overlap between the AAVE and queer speak. Yeah. And so a lot of folks think that that's separate, that they're two distinct things. Mm-hmm. That intersection. But I'm here to tell you as well that <laughs> it's almost always black queer vernacular. There is it very is a few. A lot of the the language that people are using is black queer vocabulary. Mm-hmm. Kiki, I mean, I just said Kiki, like the T reading, shade, all that stuff. And that's the old school stuff. That's, that's not the, even the new school that's stuff. That's the old stuff. Um, so really, like black women and black queer people are kind of leading what folks think are cool, as has been the case for decades. Mm. And white people still try to just. Take it. Pretend like it's just, it's Gen Z slang. Take it. <laughs> I don't know what millennial slang is. They, they're they so mean to us. They say, millennial slang to, to them is like, uh, what Harry Potter house are you? Oh my God. Or uh, doggo. <laughs> <laughs> We've gotten this far and I still haven't asked you my question yet. And mine's not that deep. Okay. I just want to know what is the one song that you think has dominated your 2022. Cuff it, cuff it, cuff it, cuff it, baby. (laughs) That was a strong contender in the second half. (laughs) For me, but it's You Bring Me Joy for me. Anita Baker. Still, yeah. All right. All year, like the entire summer I spent on the beach by myself or whatever. Like that song, it's, it still is that song. It is, it is that girl. But for 2022 songs, I rarely listen to new music. You never do. No. Um, Kill Bill by SZA is coming in hot in the last few weeks of December. I'm loving. That's not, I didn't ask you for oh. a big old rundown okay, of fine. the best songs of then 2022. The song that I'm dominated saying, what is your for me song? Yeah, was Cuff It and Heated from Rolling okay. Stones. I don't have a song of 2021. I have one of 2022, which I think is You Bring Me Joy. And then of 2020, for sure, once the rarities came out, it was Oh Homo, out here on my own. It was, because that was number one on our Spotify wrapped <laughs> by far. That was such a gift. R.I.P. I- Irene Cara. Right? Yeah. That just happened a couple of weeks ago. Miss Irene Cara of fame, fame, passed away. That brings us to the end of the show. Might be our longest show ever. Will it be could two be. episodes? It could be. We'll see what's what gets cut. Mm. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy our tennis stuff, if you enjoy this pop culture stuff, we've got a GoFundMe going. Yep. We are 70%. 74. 74. Oh, wow. Point something. Very precise. We, you know, we are so incredibly grateful to the folks who've contributed already. We have a, a very rough goal 
of 15,000. It's not like a make or break thing, but we hope to hit it. Yeah. So <laughs> it would be cool. The GoFundMe is still open. We are like literally in in the midst of planning a trip that we have to decide on very soon or we're going to lose this reservation a credit that has somehow lasted since 2020 mm-hmm. so yeah we're going to be doing tennis stuff in 2023 provided my body cooperates you literally had an injection in your spine today not in the spine just near it near it i mean it was the people don't it's, need, it's a cortisone the people don't need to know the details but yeah you know i've been dealing with some shit it has really impeded my ability to travel, but I'm optimistic about this year. If I can't go anywhere, Jonathan will <laughs> go to tennis tournaments. Like this, you know, this is what the GoFundMe is really for. And yeah, we're man, season season nine is coming up. Mm-hmm. And it's December fifteenth. This episode will be out December sixteenth. And then we'll get, like, maybe over two weeks off. Mm-hmm. I mean, these past two weeks have, have been kind of a break, so we yeah, spaced true. out our hiatus. Everyone have a, a wonderful holiday season. If you don't celebrate holidays, I'm so sorry they have to be bombarded by this annoying Santa stuff. But we will see you in 2023. But I will not apologize for all I want for Christmas is you. No. That I will not be doing. That's non-denominational. All right. Thank you for listening to our thoughts on culture. Till next time. Thank you very much.